I'm practicing for a new comedy show that I'm working on. Yeah? Yeah. Slapstick. I still need to practice a little bit, but okay, okay. I'm, you know, try I think that all you, are, you are in the right path. I'm in the right path, for sure. So, great woman now. One of the most amazing uh, women in the, in the games industry. Yeah, she's Crazy. a game developer. Mm -hmm. She's an adventurous uh, artist as mm -hmm. well, collaborating with many other artists like Bill Piola, doing amazing games, but also she's one, you could say, one of the most respected voices in the academia. Yeah, I, I think if more than that, I, th I think her work has been very influential for the many uh, uh, professors um, uh, around the world now teaching yeah. games, right? He, she was one of the pioneers, and she's still one of the big references for anyone teaching games and designing games as well, because yeah. her textbook uh, is a reference in the schools for game design, I think and many professionals use it uh, at home as well. The book might be used in almost every university that teaches about mm -hmm. video games in the world. So Tracy Fullerton, quite a mind, together with Gonzalo Frasca. Gonzalo Frasca, there is another very special guest, a mastermind of game design, uh, especially of educational games. Yeah, making uh, math. Making math games with Dragon Box, very successful games. If you haven't tried them uh, with your kids, I strongly recommend them. I have two kids my own, and they are loving the games and learning a lot of maths. But the conversation, I think, is good to highlight that what we wanted to do here is to um, tell the people and to explain to people how important is the academia now yeah. in the games world. Not only for helping new designers to do a better job and to create better games, but also for the whole games industry yeah. to become a better place. And also creating this new generation of minds that, is, that are, are going to be in the market in the future. Exactly, because it's not only about creating good games, but also about understanding the new medium. And that, if you study at the university like USC or like University of Arts in Uruguay, in the case of Gonzalo, you need to learn that, like many other skills in life, from your professors, right? And so academia is, is making a big influence now, yeah. but it will make a bigger influence in the future. And we want to speak with them mm -hmm. about this and many more things, of and course. Where are they at the moment? Gonzalo, I guess, are in Montevideo? Yeah, beautiful Montevideo. We have an, uh, our own Game Lab Montevideo there yeah. every year. Yeah, indeed. And uh, Tracy is uh, at home, I guess, like, at home with, uh, with uh, some of, their, uh, of her cats. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll see some of them uh, in Los Angeles. Okay, so I guess that Tracy and Gonzalo are waiting for us to say hello. I hope so, let's see. Hello Tracy, hello Gonzalo, are you, are you there? Hi guys. Thank you, thank you very much, Ivan, and, and welcome, Tracy. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be talking to, to Tracy Fullerton today. Uh, this is going to be fun. Uh, this is quite an honor, and unfortunately, we, we can't be physically in Barcelona, which will be even more fun, but a lot more people can, can uh, see us and, and, and get into this conversation. So without further ado, I mean, uh, well, if you don't know Tracy, Ivan has introduced her, but I would uh, also like to add that, I mean, she's not only an amazing designer, she's, she's wrote like one of the main books I've been using in for way too long, I think, uh, uh, for, I don't know, when was it published, Tracy, your, your, um, your book on game uh, design, your workshop? First published in 2004, and we're now on the third edition, uh, which was published, uh, the, the third edition was published last year. Well, it's a uh, it's a classic. I mean, uh, I, I still use it. I still recommend it to my students. And it was uh, printed and written well before I, my my beard was white. So uh, that's quite an achievement for any book. 
I mean, that's still relevant, but uh, especially for for game design. And uh, and Tracy, also as a, as a designer, well, her most uh, recent uh, game, if I'm not wrong, is Walled in a Game uh, that you should check out. And uh, well, as I said, let's let's talk about uh, these two worlds that sometimes can collaborate, which is the, the game industry and uh, and academia. So Tracy, you you've been uh, you had a front seat in the last two decades of, on on how uh, basically well game studies and game programs in on uh, universities uh, have taken off. And my first question is very simple and <laughs> I guess very hard. It's like, what have you seen? I mean, what has changed in the, these almost two decades? Uh, everything, <laughs> I think, would be the short, uh, uh, too long, don't read answer to that. But uh, no, you know, when uh, when I first started teaching game design, uh, it was uh, we were down in the basement. We were sort of an we were an elective. Uh, we were kind of hidden away from the other classes. No one really knew we were there. Uh, but the people interested in games found us. Right. Um, and it was almost this little secret quest if they could find their way down the back stairway all the way to the basement where we were teaching, um, then uh, they, you know, sort of basically were awarded. They were they were leveled up with a chance to take our initial game design courses. Uh, and of course, that's that's all different now. Right. Um, as you mentioned, there's, you know, many uh, great games programs worldwide and um, uh, game studies is a is a big part of that, uh, but of course the um, preparation for entering the game industry um, is also sort of the the other the other half. It's it's not just academic uh, studies of games. It's also a preparation uh, for people to enter and to lead. I think um, new aspects uh, of the industry. So. Um, I think that you know one really big thing that has changed. I will say is who comes to the program. So as I mentioned, you know, early on it was people who were who were able to find us somehow. You know, uh, and they were already in love with games, and um, there was a kind of uh, you know sort of a dedicated core of geeks, I guess, who found us, right? And nowadays it's a much broader cultural. Uh, possibility set. So people are coming to programs to study games, and I, you know, I speak from my own experience at our program. We get people coming from different backgrounds to study games because they understand that games are, um, you know, an expressive media. That they're an important social media. That they um, are, in a way, that the media of this century. And um, they want to study games. They may not have been lifelong hardcore gamers, but that's not the necessity at this point. The necessity is people who are um, who have a passion and who have things to say um, and ideas to make in in the new world of games. Not necessarily what games have been, but but thinking of what games may be. So to me, that's I think the the arc that I've seen is who comes to the program, and really what the goals of people who want to study games um, uh, have to have become. Oh, I want to mention one thing. Yeah. Uh, because it's fair, and that is, um, uh, I am the founding director emeritus. So I want to give a shout out to Danny Bilson, who's the current chair and current director of USC Games. Uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, because I've been, I was director for for you know quite some time. Uh, that that gets lost, but Danny's leading and doing a fantastic job, and it gives me time to focus on on my creative work and uh, uh, the games I'm designing. That's good. Um, just as a side comment, because uh, uh, there's something that happened to me when you mentioned, okay, this diversity of uh, of people joining uh, uh, the university to to learn everything about games. Uh, I teach at Uni Universidad Ort in in Uruguay, and uh, one of the things that I realized that at first shocked me, but then I accepted, and and I think it's it's still a, a, a great thing. I don't know what what that happened to you is that sometimes I get students that they see this not as we used to like, okay, this is my chance to follow my passion, but 
just like a career, like a nice career. And mm. uh, I'm not passionate, but their attitude is, is kind of different to what it could have been like 20 years ago, or like I would have killed in my days to have a university program on this. So uh, <laughs> what do you think about that? I, I, I mean, what would be your, your opinion? I don't know uh, what happened to you. I suppose, you know, what's interesting though, I think maybe, maybe uh, because uh, I, the university I'm at is so, uh, well, it's so hard to get into. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, we are very selective. Um, we we only choose about three percent of the applicants. So um, we are looking specifically for people who have that passion, who um, have probably already been making and doing in, in either in games or in other creative fields, right? So I don't see that sort of more professional, like I just want a job, um, that's, maybe that gets weeded out in our application process uh, a little bit, you know? Um, I certainly, I know what you're talking about, and I certainly have, have met people uh, who, who are interested in games, it's a good job, and it is a good job, obviously. Uh, uh, it's a great job, <laughs> in fact. Uh, you have to be careful because uh, if you do have so much passion for it, uh, you're, you are, of course, setting yourself up um, to be, um, you know, overused in many ways. And, you know, we know that there's is, the, the issue of crunch is still a big issue uh, in the industry. And interestingly enough, it, it had, has actually become an issue in academic institutions as well with the students pouring so much time and effort into their games that they have a form of, of crunch. Um, and we're, we've been actually working really hard to get students to become better at estimating their work and organizing it and scoping their projects to the extent of the resources that they have and not letting the, the scope drive them, um, so to speak. But yeah, to get back to your original question, uh, I, I guess where I'm at, maybe I'm, um, because we choose so few of the applicants, um, they really have to have that passion. It's one of the defining right. uh, qualifications, if you will. Yeah, and, and, and we'll talk more about crunch later, but um, I wanted to follow up with uh, academics in this 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 actual panel. I mean, this actual interview, the way it's framed on the on this event. Historically, academics we had to like sort of like justify our existence uh, sometimes, right? I convince the industry that hey, play with us. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna it's gonna be great. And uh, so my my question is like, okay, over these almost two decades, what do you think has been the, the largest contributions or, uh, from from uh, academia to to the game uh, industry and 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 game culture? In the broader sense? I mean, to me, that's that's pretty simple. Sorry, my cat's going to join us, but um, uh, that's okay. it's pretty simple. <laughs> um, it, it's pretty simple, and that is the, um, I, I feel that the uh, quality of, of innovation, come on now, let's go, the quality of innovation that we see in student work and the way that uh, these student projects have fed a lot of the um, indie development that has driven some real content innovation in the industry, uh, and, and I think opened up people's eyes to a type of game making that is, um, you know, less focused on, uh, you know, intense graphics processing, right, and more focused on uh, a kind of sim simple, elegant gameplay, uh, perhaps a less um, intensive graphics, but, but really on finding new things that are interesting about play. And that has something I think that the academic game programs have always fostered from the beginning and have driven a lot of the engine of uh, indie development. And so that contribution is in the, in the form of, uh, you know, what, what is out there? We are the space explorers, if you will, of the industry. The industry has never been great about uh, doing R&D in terms of uh, new possibilities of play. Uh, they do a lot of R&D and things like graphics and engineering and hardware platforms, but the 
um, as a whole, the industry has not spent a lot of time um, in terms of R and D in, in new genres of play, new um, situations of play, and the academic games programs. That's what we do. That's our bread and butter, right? And so I think you you see a lot of uh, the influence of that, um, you know, blue sky thinking on uh, on the industry. Now that's not to say that. Uh, the industry still doesn't have its massive, uh, you know, uh, sort of its own bread and butter, so to speak, right, of the AAA sort of, you know, uh, uh, genres that existed before and probably will exist until the end of time. Uh, but I'm just saying that we are exploring outer, la outer sort of layers of, of possibilities, and we can do that because of all that energy and enthusiasm and, and passion and uh, and expertise that, that the students develop while they're in school. Yeah, that, that's one of the advantages of, okay, at the university time is slower than in, than at the industry, the, the, the game studio. You have a, a, one of the resources, the key resources uh, is that time, uh, you seem to have a little more time. But uh, on the other hand, I mean, that sometimes creates, well, difficulties to, to understand each other. So. Uh, can you tell me like one or success story of, of actual collaboration uh, that you're particularly proud of that you've seen in your program or, or elsewhere between like a game studio and, and, a, and a university program? Well, I mean, I think there's the obvious one, which is that game company, right? That came directly out mm -hmm. of our, our uh, program and, uh, you know, uh, Genova Chen's uh, capstone thesis for his MFA, uh, Flow, uh, uh, of course, was one of the early uh, titles on the PlayStation Network and, um, you know, went on to really successfully build a company based around innovation and uh, a, a type of expressive uh, emotional gameplay that we really had not seen before or had not seen before done so well. Right, so I think that's a that's a very uh, uh, easy early example, and then you know there have been a lot of interesting um, sort of other studies that maybe are not as well known. Uh, I think you know we have folks who who have gone from uh, our department into say working in virtual reality and creating some of the hardware and software that is driving that new uh, phase of virtual reality, right? Um, so people like Mark Bolas, who uh, is a professor at uh, our uh, program, who went to Microsoft to work uh, for several years, is now coming back, but basically what he calls it is getting re-greened. So taking all the innovation he'd been working on at USC, going, taking that expertise, going to Microsoft and really working on real products, and then um, hopefully bringing a lot of that re-greening of being in industry back uh, to work with us and our students. I think that's, um, that's a really interesting kind of exchange for professors especially. Um, you know, w one of the things that I always find interesting is how many students are entrepreneurial. So I guess, you know, a lot of my success stories are gonna be about entrepreneurial efforts. We see the um, folks from uh, Outer Wilds, for example, in the past year or so, um, you know, their student version of Outer Wilds, um, you know, won the Seamus McNally IGF award. And then they went on to uh, form uh, Mobius and produce a commercial version of Outer Wilds, which, um, you know, has gotten a lot of attention and awards and is a really beautiful, uh, uh, it's a really beautiful expression of, of this tiny little universe that you sort of testify to as it dies, right? You, you become this, this explorer whose job it is to seek out all the nooks and crannies of this universe and almost just testify to its beauty before, before it explodes and dies. Uh, I think that, you know, that's again that's a project that would have been difficult uh to develop uh pre-production on um outside of the university and they were able to do that as as alex beach's thesis project and then go get kick-started and 
form a company and release it to to um, uh, you know really great success. So I you know I see those kinds of impacts as being really uh, critical. We're you know we're creating people, we're creating um, game designers, but also possibly entrepreneurs, uh, innovative leaders, and the idea is that they go out and they do things that that they could have done if they had just gone on and got an entry level job at you know um, EA or something right now they might have done something different if they had gone on and got that entry level job and that that would have been a really valid and interesting thing and I can tell you a lot of stories of students who have gone on to to do that and have really fine careers um, but when we talk about impact I think we're talking about uh, uh, innovation and and leadership and and to a greater or lesser extent entrepreneur um, uh, entrepreneurial effort. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's it's clear that in terms of innovation, I mean, there's there's been a lot of successes, and 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 it's a fertile ground for for that uh, at universities. But let's let's go. I mean, because there are success cases, but not everybody, I mean, not all students all over the world, uh, get a chance to 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 become entrepreneurs and to get the attention of the projects uh, deserve. Maybe and not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. I mean, that's the thing. Not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's why I, I want to ask you that because you mentioned it. It's like, okay, that could be a, a that is a core contribution to to the industry. But let's go into more subtle aspects. I mean, you mentioned crunch. Let's talk about diversity. I mean, what uh, what more long term subtle changes? uh the university uh, education can uh, can have an impact on on the industry i think we can have a great impact frankly um you know when, when i grew up in the industry you know it was the time of you just like you had an idea you built a great big huge design document and then you just made it and you made it until you died. You just like, you know, it was like this march of death. Let's, we're going to make this thing that we planned, right? And it's, it was really a setup for failure, right? And I think that the university has this opportunity um, to train people in a way that they become better team leaders, right? Uh, in, whether it's in an area of speciality or whether it's leading a, a an entire production team, but to train them in both um, agile methods, but also in um, a, a more humane production process that starts, you know, we look to, for example, uh, Mark Cerny's classic uh, lecture on method as a model for the, the um, kind of production that we teach our students. And Richard LaMarchand, who's uh, one of our professors and worked with Mark and worked at Naughty Dog for, for many years, um, has uh, really taken the uh, uh, Cerny's method and taken the play-centric um, uh, design process that um, I outlined in Game Design Workshop and really crafted uh, an arc for our students that, that allows them to create uh, their projects in a non-crunch environment. If they listen, if they really listen to us about how to plan and how to scope, they can create their projects from start to finish in a non-crunch environment. And the interesting thing about the, the arc of um, uh, development is that you mentioned having a lot of time. But I would argue that a lot of student games don't have a lot of time because it's either a 10 week or a 16 week or 15 week, it depends on what the semesters are, right? Uh, but it, it could be a very short amount of time. And to look to make a complete game in that short amount of time uh, just points to, okay, we're gonna crunch in those last weeks before finals to get our game done. So, you know, we've tried to take this, this production arc focus very much on pre-production where you do your, you know, you find your core mechanic and you create your macro for your game and you um, basically figure out your man hours for the rest of production and you scope your game based on those available man hours. And Richard, you know, uh, would be better to, uh, I think, dive into it because he's, he's very eloquent about it. But all of our students and um, our classes use this method 
And I think it has helped us, if not, we have not eradicated crunch, I will not say that, but it has helped us to um, make crunch not normal, right? To, to, to uh, basically begin to train these students to, to denormalize the idea that you're just gonna kill yourself to make your game, right? And to make important the way you make your game. Uh, the way you make your game in terms of living your life and balancing your life and putting your passion where it's going to count are super important. And that leads us to this other topic, which you, you mentioned, which is inclusion, you know, of all voices, inclusion, diversity, uh, to, uh, you know, how do we train teams to uh, get the best out of everyone and not leave people by the wayside, for example, voices that might have improved our game. So in this, this effort to make our students you know, learn a production method that does not normalize crunch, we are also trying to build into that a way of normalizing inclusion um, and uh, bringing alternate voices into the creative process. Um, we have partnerships across campus where we bring in people from many different disciplines to work on the, the games. And we practice a kind of um, uh, team building that emphasizes inclusion at all levels. Yeah, that's, that's an important topic is that um, when you mention uh, collaboration, uh, well, within the team, but also within the university, within within other departments, other researchers, the students or teachers, and uh, that's something that sometimes uh, in the industry we, we we tend to think about uh, the academic world. Okay, just the game program, but uh, what kind of strange collaborations? I mean, like unexpected uh, collaborations. Have you seen across campus of some discipline that you wouldn't say at, at first that it could get into a game and ended up being like an important part of it? Uh, I don't know if it's unexpected, but I think we, you know, we have a really strong collaboration um, with uh, the medical school on campus. And so uh, Marion Tina Gotthard, who, who runs our uh, creative media and behavioral health research lab, um, she works with the school of social work, she works with uh, physical therapy, and the Games that they build are medical interventions as well as being, um, you know, really fascinating games. So uh, that's that's a really strong collaboration. I myself have worked a lot with the School of Education um, to build uh, uh, educational interventions as part of the games that we des we've designed in the Game Innovation Lab. And I, you know, I think that's. Um, uh, those are those are not necessarily un unusual. Uh, to see uh, academic researchers in games working with uh, researchers in other other fields like uh, medicine and health. Uh, one of the fun ones I thought uh, we're actually working on right now is one of our advanced, our advanced games projects is uh, uh, we have a student who uh, wants to make a video game of Palota um, and um, uh, so has reached out to the uh, history and anthropology um, uh, departments to find professors who can, you know, help them understand the team, understand uh, the importance, this, you know, the cultural significance, um, the historical context of how the game disappeared and why we don't know about it and why it, you know, there are people who are attempting to bring it back um, as a, a, you know, important cultural mile, you know, it's a, a pillar. Right. So uh, I, I found that to be a kind of interesting one to, ha to have a student reach out across campus in that regard. Um, I think there are, there are um, probably many more that I don't know about. I know there's been a lot of work with the School of Music on some of our musical games. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that they're unexpected, frankly. Games encompass so many different disciplines that it's not really unexpected to collaborate with other fields, right? Um, it, it, it's certainly not unexpected to collaborate with engineering. It's not expected to, uh, unexpected to collaborate with animation. We collaborate with the music school and uh, we collaborate with the business school. None of these seem unexpected to me, but the more you reach out, the more you realize that, uh, you know, 
collaborating with folks in cognitive psychology is not unexpected, but it's absolutely expected, right? That we should be doing it and as a program and as game designers. So, uh, so, so one of the things for me is it's actually always been so exciting what a learning opportunity uh, it is to work in games and be able to collaborate with all these other fields all of the time. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, for designers, anybody who can speak systems, I mean, we feel right at home and we can uh, easily collaborate. But uh, from the outside, that might not be that evident, right? I, I mean, uh, especially because uh, it's still pervasive, well, to see games mainly as a form of entertainment and and of course i'm not saying that the industry perceives uh games just like that but um but it might not be the bread and butter of a lot of people working on um, making games uh, day to day to to just see uh to just assume that well okay if i collaborate with university hey i'm getting like uh, the possibility to have my own uh think tank across many disciplines so it's a great deal right i mean for especially for 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 a company that's not that large or or, or a corporation. Um, I want to ask you about uh, challenges um, because uh, we've been talking mainly, okay, how can we uh, contribute to the industry? But sometimes uh, I have seen over the years, especially with, with, with students that uh, are a lot into, into game design, difficulties, or it's to to understand that like the financial aspects of, of games and of course there's many aspects i mean i'm not just talking about um corporate making but uh do you think uh we should do better uh on that on that uh we've been talking about uh, being entrepreneur but also understanding the the financial implications of, of game making because you connected it to like crunch and and quality of life and well uh being able to to read a spreadsheet, a spreadsheet, and 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 see the financials, I mean, could help, I guess. Uh, what yeah, you... I agree with you, one hundred percent. In fact, the business school at USC uh, has a really strong um, uh, business of entertainment program, uh, which includes uh, classes on uh, you know the the business of games, and we have a a, a lot of students from that. Sorry, hang on, hang on. you got to get down now. Uh, we have sorry we have a lot of students uh who come over from the business school to collaborate with our advanced games program uh, uh projects specifically um we even have a business student leading one of our advanced games projects uh this year because um he came with a really interesting business model for a game and we paired him up with a game design student to build a game around this business model and so I think it. I think what you're saying is super interesting and super important. Uh, I would I would add that it's equally important for uh, students to begin to understand the legal aspects of games. Um, so we actually even have a class on uh, game law, um, and taught by a professor who um, also uh, works at Riot, and who helps the students understand the basics of. Uh, intellectual property law around games, copyright law around games, and um, you know structuring uh, protection, and and also you know just understanding uh, what the uh, sort of boundaries are of that. What you know because a lot of students you know they're very secretive about their ideas, and uh, you're like, okay, well, <laughs> uh, at this level getting your idea out there and seen uh, is probably more important to you than protecting it, right? Uh, you, you know, you get to a certain level and that may switch, but right now you want to get out there and get people to know who you are. Uh, but yeah, so I think business, I think legal is super important, right? Um, and I, you know, I think that we can't underestimate the importance of continuing to chip away at the divide between creative and uh, technology. Uh, so there continues, even though we've had so many years to work on this multidisciplinary uh, aspect of games, there always continues to be kind of a language and attitude problem between, for example, engineers and, and um, designers, creative designers, um, sometimes writers, sometimes producers, There's, you know, and, and that's something we see as a, a central conversation that has to 
continually get better. And the only way to get better is to train these people together, train them up, respecting each other, being able to communicate with each other, having some of each other's skills. So everyone needs to code and everyone also needs to production manage, right? Um, to build bridges before the communication becomes an issue. Right. Let me, let me tell you a little story, be short about, uh, about myself. I've been, I've been working remotely from uh, Uruguay in South America to Norway for the last five years, right? I've been designing games while doing some managing, a lot, a lot of different things at, at Dragonbox, which is based in Oslo and, and in Paris. And uh, it's been quite a lonely five years in the sense that uh, I'm here at my studio all by myself, remotely working. And suddenly with, uh, with COVID, everybody was in the same situation as I was. And, uh, and I, I don't know if, if my work tripled or, 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 but suddenly it was as easy to call me that to call the person who used to be right next to you, right? And um, so in addition to this particular crisis that we're experiencing, I mean, remote work in game development has been going on uh, for a long time and it's getting uh, more and more popular. And I'm wondering uh, what are the advantages of a university campus-based uh, uh, education, which I can see a lot of advantages, but at the same time, like if it's likely that you're gonna be working remotely, how, how do you handle uh, in your view, in your program, I mean, this, this thing that could be somehow of a contradiction, like, uh, because I would say, okay, I, I can study online because uh, I'm gonna be working online anyway, right? Yeah, I, and this is such a great question, and it's it obviously completely pertinent right now as universities figure out what they're going to be doing in the fall. Um, you know, just on a COVID level, for us, it's very clear. Um, we don't want to take any chances with any single person in our community, so we're happier online, right? Um, and the beauty of that, as you mentioned, and I actually had a similar situation where when I started my company, uh, we had a team in New Jersey, a team in San Francisco, and I was in Los Angeles. And so the entire company for the first two years of existence before we uh, kind of consolidated two of those, those branches was all online, right? And we had to come up with, this was before Zoom, so we had to come up with ways of constantly being in touch with each other. And it's absolutely possible, and it's even more possible today. Um, so one of the interesting things that emerged out of the quick move to all online in the middle of, of last semester was uh, that we did realize that this was a skill that our students needed. It, bare, it became very clear right away that it was improving their communication skills, um, that the, the situation was causing them to be a, more deliberate, a, deliberate about how they planned and worked with each other. And we became very excited about that. And I believe that even when, because I believe it's a when, even when we come back on campus and, and have all those wonderful in-person experiences again, that I think we will continue to have some component of uh, online collaboration that continues because there are parts of it that actually have added to the experience of, of our student productions. And, you know, certainly, as you mentioned, it's going to be a marketable skill uh, to be able to be a person who can, you know, keep on point, who can be very clear in remote communication, you know, who understands how to, you know, to break up tasks and share them remotely. This is going to be a tremendous skill. So, yeah, I think there are, I don't want to be the, you know, silver linings person altogether because we miss seeing our young people in person. Uh, but I feel like in many ways, I've spent more time one-on-one -on -one with many of them. I have um, seen them grow as, as communicators and leaders on their teams. Uh, and, and I'm not entirely sad that we had this experience and this, this wake up call, except right. for the context. Yeah, it's, <laughs> as, uh, as you clearly mentioned, I mean, uh, the challenge in many aspects is about communication. And with my own students, well, they just submitted uh, their, some of their work. And, and what I'm telling them is like, 
okay, you need to improve your writing because it's likely that you, you not only will have to to work, collaborate in writing with remote uh, teams, but also like pitch stuff. Or like, I mean, your actual your actual salary may depend on how well you write. Uh, you won't get a chance to to do a, like a, a video presentation. So it's uh, it, it's it goes. It brings us back back to the basis, right? I, I mean, and that I think why a university setting where you also have an English department, you also have a communication department, can can really help students not just on the technical uh, the technical aspects. Uh, right before this this conversation, I, I got a, a call from a journalist, and she was uh, researching into uh, QAnon, the far right uh, conspiracy. Uh, uh, well, you can you can Google uh, if if you if People listen to this don't know what I'm talking about. But the interesting thing is that she's not really into games, but she was like, I need a game designer to, to, to figure this out, right? And, uh, and this is like, suddenly a journalist realizes that a game designer could bring some insight on a deeply political uh, um, subject. So um, I wanted to, to tell that story to, to ask you. I mean, let's talk a little bit about the future. I, I, um, it's not about predicting the future, but we've seen that game design and system thinking, I mean, it crawls into different areas that maybe we didn't uh, just assume they were going to be uh, going. So what do you think about that? I mean, do you think that uh, that our programs uh, prepare people for, for just more than, than, than game development? I think this is a really wonderful question. And it, to me, uh, it's not only systems design, it's media literacy. And I think that, uh, you know, the craft of game design in many ways is the craft of organizing people's motivations. And um, that can be used for good or ill. And so uh, one of the things that's important, it's important to me, it's been important to the program, um, it continues to be important to us, and I think it's a, a um, I feel it's a shared value among many of our programs, is to um, develop critical thinking in and around games as artifacts of culture and uh, as uh, media objects, media expressions that have influence on people's lives and ideas. And so this is in one way, as you're pointing out, um, there's, uh, there possibly are opportunities uh, for uh, you know, future jobs for both the good and the ill, right? Now, we could, we could, let's posit it for the good, just for the sake of it. Um, uh, we might envision a world where there's always a game designer on staff at a high school. And that game designer's job is to help motivate the students to organize their efforts towards their own personal goals, right? And to provide uh, interesting challenges to groups of students who are, who are interested in, in, in similar goals, right? And so as opposed to curriculum designers, we might say, well, what about game designers? Because game designers are a, re a gift, it's a, it's a gifted part of designing experiences that teach us, or I should say, allow us to learn within them, right? So that's a, that's a, a whole possible career path is game designer slash curriculum, curriculum designer, right? Which I think would be amazing. You can also posit the same path down, uh, you know, game designer slash community organizer, right? Where people are building, helping b create games that build ties in our fractured society. This may be one of the most important possibilities that we could talk about, right? Um, actually, Ben Stokes, um, one of my former PhD students, uh, just published a book around local play and the idea of uh, game design and um, uh, community uh, uh, activism basically is being linked and studying that through network analysis analysis and so these are you know just two possibilities right um, of course I think that the reporter was calling you because there are darker possibilities and we've seen that play out um, you know over certainly the you know 
last uh, um, U.S. presidential election, where um, you know the mobilization of particular types of uh, gamers and um, uh, sub sort of subsets of, of gamers um, became a model for uh, mobilizing uh, an entire uh, group of non-interested voters and uh, and uh, a kind of well let's just say not uh, desirable people right to to mm -hmm. uh, um, be part of the swaying the election so and and it's it's been said that you know for example uh, Steve Bannon looked to uh, online games as a model for the kind of uh, you know change he wanted to make right so there's light sides which I I would prefer to work towards, and then I think there are there are darker undersides where uh, behavioral motivation and systems thinking can be used uh, to sway the world in not good ways. But to combat that, we need to, like you say, I think we need to be training our our, our students for these good opportunities, right? Because if we can use game design and the art of, of game design for a positive, then people will be less susceptible to uh, the ill effects of, of negative uses, right? And if we can train them to be critical uh, of media, to have a, a kind of media literacy that's very important, then they will also be less susceptible. Yeah, to be, to be able to be free to play and decide not to be played, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah we, we're definitely in a, in a particular context right now. I mean, uh, of crisis, uh, not just uh, global crisis, but also uh, COVID and, and uh, Black Lives Matter also. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. And, um, and I think what you're saying, uh, it's, it's very important in the sense that, okay, the media sometimes presents like video games as silver bullets to solve all ills in the world. Okay. But, uh, but it's, it's really, really important that they provide us tools for, for better understanding the, uh, the world. And, and as we were saying, I mean, our, our own freedoms, um, and what should I do with, time, what, with, with rules, with other people, how to collaborate. Uh, this has been uh, really, truly a, a pleasure and an honor to talk to you. I think uh, Ivan has a question for you now. Oh, okay. Yes, um, that was a fantastic, a fantastic conversation that gave me a lot of no nostalgia because uh, you probably don't know, but Game Lab was originally a, a, a research and innovation lab at the university as well. I was an academic myself for 13 years. So many of the things you were talking about, many of the things you were addressing were part of my daily life and they still are some, uh, some way. Um, also, uh, in this particular event, uh, I know, as a matter of fact, that we have a lot of um, students from different universities in Spain, of course, in Uruguay, the University of Art, where Gonzalo is working, also from USC as well. We have several people connecting to watch your, your, your talk, your chat with Gonzalo. And, and I was wondering, uh, one, one point that you didn't touch, I think, is the, the, the need of collaboration as well, of, of connection, making bridges between all that huge and, and growing academic world, right? How, what could we do to connect uh, our students, our academics better around the world? So that, um, that effort that you are doing from your particular universities can you know, get more powerful by bringing all the people, all the academic community together. And that's a question for both of you, I think. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're having a little trouble with your mic, but I get the gist of your question. Um, uh, so that's a really wonderful question. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad we're leaving it to the end. And, you know, it, obviously, you know, I talked a lot about reaching out to the various departments of, uh, of a university to, to collaborate, but you're absolutely right. We, um, we have this greater wealth of the sort of global community of game programs and and uh, academic research labs, um, and so that is a and you know just students, right? Uh, that is a fantastic opportunity. Um, one of the things we actually do is we actually um, 
uh, take our students to other universities and pitch their ideas so that they can collaborate across different programs. So um, we have uh, worked with, uh, for example, artists from other programs. We've worked with uh, the Berkeley College of Music, um, as well as our own uh, music school, to to, uh, to get to foster that kind of working across schools. And if you're able, it's a little difficult sometimes in academia to really sync up the dates of classes. But if you're able to find another professor and sync up the dates of your classes, it can be an amazing experience for the students to be able to, you know, work on their own projects for like say a, a you know composing for games class and then have those be deliverables as part of a larger collaborative project um, with a, another university and it's created ties for life i mean i've had students who never met in person with their composers or with their artists um, and then tell me oh we're, we're all going to get together and make a company right because we met online in this collaboration and we're all going to get, and I think the same is really great for academics in general to be able to reach out and to collaborate across those university lines. It's something that's very special. Each program has its own culture and its own way of making. And when you're able to unite those, um, I think you, there's some, some magic, some, some alchemy happens, right? When you, when you call when you're able to collaborate with another culture and how they make things. And I was going to say, you know, one of the, I'm going to be silver lining for just a minute. One of the kind of amazing things about uh, this experience we've all had is that almost all, I believe pretty much all of the games programs that I know about went online with their final student showcases this year. And um fantastic i was because they're all over the world right but i was able to go and attend these student showcases which i could never do in the past right they're too far away i mean you could you wouldn't travel to just go to another school student showcase you just go to your own but that's kind of insular right but i was able to see the work from these other programs online you know and see what their students are doing and and you know see their faculty talk about it. it's really something special right so there's there are lessons for us again as as teachers as as academics in this global communication and the possibilities now with with pro programs going on and i know for us anyways we were so excited about the online showcase that um even when we go back to having a live showcase we believe we will continue to have an online showcase because it was so special and uh, i suspect there are many other universities who will do the same Okay, that's great. Um, I think we're running out of time. Uh, we could keep talking uh, for hours with the two of you. Uh, once again, it's been amazing. We love the, the nature in this, uh, <laughs> in this talk, the, the flowers that, uh, and the plants that Gonzalo has, the, your wonderful cat that was very fun to, to watch. I'm so embarrassed. That, no, that, this is uh, so amazing. This, this is making Interspecies collaboration. Better. Yeah, exactly. So, Let's, let's make a, a purpose for, for the coming years to, to get things uh, better between, I mean, among all of us, just keep on pushing uh, young people the way you're pushing them. And um, hopefully we can meet uh, in person soon. I'm so looking forward to it. Meanwhile, stay safe. And once again, thank you so much for, for participating in this adventure of Game Lab Life 2020. Thank you. Thank you so much for having thank me. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.